He says, if you want to know the value of these components, the way you compute them is you take the, the tensor as a linear function of vectors. The first index alpha is up, and so I'll stick an E alpha with its index up into the first slot. The second index beta is up, so I'll stick an E beta with its index up. Third one, E gamma is up, so I'll stick an E gamma index up. And that's a real number, and that turns out as a theorem to be the value of the components you need in order to make this be true. And similarly, T mu nu gamma is what you get by taking T, just line up the indices, E down mu, E down nu, E up gamma. And you've computed uh, what you need. Okay. So, example, the metric tensor. G down alpha beta is, you take the metric, you stick E down alpha in the first slot, E down beta in the second slot. But our definition of the, uh, me of the metric was such that G of evaluate on two vectors, it's just the inner product of those two vectors. So that's from our definition of the metric. And so G alpha beta is just the inner product of the basis vectors, but line them up, make sure that it's the same indices, alpha, alpha, beta, beta, both of them down. If I am in a Lorentz frame, then E0 points in the time direction and has unit length, uh, and the spatial indices point in space directions and have unit length. And so the values that you get out are something that G00 is minus 1. GJK uh, is the Kronecker delta, and G0J is 0. And that's the familiar metric that you use in special relativity. It's usually in special relativity, unless you use ICT. Okay. If you use ICT, then you have the Euclidean metric, which is why people use ICT. But if you don't use ICT, you have, oops, G00 is minus 1. Somebody should have jumped on me. G00 is minus 1 because the inner product of E0 with itself is minus 1 because E0 points in a time direction. Okay. These values are typically uh, denoted eta alpha beta in special relativity, and if you think of this as a matrix, then the values are minus 1, 1, 1, 1 down the diagonals and 0 everywhere else. But those values follow from our de definition of the metric, which relied on the concept of the interval, uh, that is the squared length of, uh, of infinitesimal vectors, going through this analysis and evaluating the metric on these basis vectors. Um, similarly, G up alpha beta is going to be equal to uh, G evaluated on E up alpha, E up beta, or that's E up alpha dot E up beta. That's eta alpha beta, which viewed as a matrix is the same as eta down beta, alpha beta, for those of you who remember from special relativity. It's the same matrix, but uh, with the same entries. And the mixed metric, G alpha up down beta, is G evaluated on E alpha, evaluated on e alpha up, E down beta, and that is E alpha dot e beta, one is uh, index is up and the other is down, and that's just the Kronecker delta by virtue of the duality relationship between the up bases and down bases. Okay, okay so that's the metric tensor. And now I have finally, I'll go down here and do it in a little, well, no, I'll come over here. Um,
I have finally in this series of issues the following question. If you know the components of a tensor that have some of the components, some of the indices up and some down, and you want to know the components where you have other arrangements of up and down, how do you get them? And so this again is a theorem which I'm giving you to prove that T uh, mu nu gamma, if you wanted to compute that from T alpha beta gamma, you do it by lowering the alpha index with the metric, it's G alpha mu, lower the beta index of the metric G beta nu. And so all you need to remember is you raise and lower indices with the components of the metric, um, and uh, the details of how you do it are obtained just by lining up indices. These, this first index mu is down, the first index alpha is up, so it must be a G down alpha that gets summed over. And then the free index mu is down over here, and so forth. And similarly, T alpha beta gamma is G alpha rho, T rho beta gamma. I raise this rho index uh, with the metric uh, uh, components. So this is, again, is a theorem that follows almost trivially from the definitions that I have. But the bottom line, then, is that all the equations that I have uh, been dealing with here, how to raise and lower indices with the metric, um, how to compute components of the metric tensor or compute components of any other tensor, uh, how to expand a tensor in terms of bases, uh, you don't have to memorize anything as long as you know the concepts. You just line up the indices. The free indices on both sides of an equation have to be in the same positions, down or up, and have the same names. And if you're summing over any indices, they've got to be one up and one down. And that summation basically strangles the indices, makes them go away, makes those slots go away. Okay. okay. Okay, I need another concept. That's the concept of contraction. And this is a concept that is awfully complicated to think about and describe in the abstract notation that I'm using. But I'm going to introduce it in the abstract notation in the following way. We've already seen that if you have any tensor, you can write it in terms of its components. So you write it as basically a sum of things that are tensor products of vectors. And quite generally then, without actually writing down a basis, if I have a tensor, let's call it R, uh, that has four slots, I can always find some set of basics of, of vectors such that I can write this as a sum over terms, each term of which is a, is a uh, tensor product of vectors. And so I'm going to define the concept of contraction only on something like this, and then linearity of all the mathematics that I'm doing tells you how you do it on something else. You just uh, add things together. Everything that we're doing is linear algebra. Okay. So the contraction on the first and third slots of A, tensor product B, tensor product C, tensor product D. This is a guy that's a fourth rank tensor. It has four slots. This is defined to be the thing you get by taking the first guy, A, and the third guy, C. The first guy, A, is associated with this first slot. C is associated with the third slot. Uh, by the definition of tensor products. I take the first guy and the third guy, and I take their inner products with each other to get a real number. And then I have the rest of this train, B tensor product D, which now has just two slots left. 
And what I have managed to do by a contraction on the first and third slots is I have managed to uh, get rid of two of the slots, the first and third slots, and I have uh, uh, wound up with then a second rank tensor in this manner. I like to think of myself as having strangled these two slots on each other. I guess that's a male kind of a phrase, isn't it? There's always violence in the, in the language that males use. I apologize to the women in the, in the class. I, I strangle the first and third uh, uh, slots on each other and wind up with just two slots afterwards. Now, any equation that I write down in this abstract notation can be equally well written down in terms of components. In some basis, what, uh, what does it say in terms of components? So it's rather easy to go through the issue of uh, defining the components in the manner that I have and see, and, uh, see from that that in fact, in terms of components, what this contraction is, the value of the contraction is, well, it's, it's clear right here, it's A alpha, let me call it A mu C uh, mu, that's an inner product um, of the two with each other, uh, times B beta D delta. So an inner product of A with C, I claim is A mu C mu. Uh, let me just derive that a little bit. A dot C is equal to uh, is equal to A alpha. Let me call it A mu C nu uh, E mu uh, dot E nu. This inner product is just G mu nu. So the inner product is A mu C nu G mu nu. But this g mu nu can be regarded as lowering this new index, giving me a mu c mu. So this inner product there is a mu c mu, and these guys, the components of this of this tensor product, is uh, similarly you can easily see just b beta d delta. And so this is what the contraction of that tensor looks like. And then by analogy, if you have this great big tensor in the language of components in, on a basis, if you have this big tensor that's made by summing up a whole bunch of terms like this, it will still be true that the contraction on the one and three uh, uh, indices of this tensor uh, R is going to have as its components uh, R first index mu, then I have beta, third index mu, and then I have delta. That is, I have just taken the third guy, the third guy, which was C, uh, and I have lowered his, uh, the third index, which was uh, C, which was the index that was on the C, I lower the third index, and then I contract on the first and third indices as I sum over the first and third indices. So that is the component of the contraction. And you notice uh, this is very easy to write down. But writing down what the contraction means in terms of the abstract notation is, uh, is a headache. Okay. But this expression here is an expression for components in some basis. And I now want you to uh, change your viewpoint on this expression. And I want you to be able to view this expression in two different ways. The first way is the manner in which I have introduced components. The, this R, uh, uh, let me back up and say, say something like R alpha beta gamma delta. These are the components on a basis of the tensor R, R0, 3, 2, 0 has a, a particular value such as 17. Okay, and uh, and similarly, R0, 1, 1, 2 has a particular value such as 13. Uh, and so that's what components meant up until now. But I now want to look at this same expression and. Uh, say this expression means something else. 
This expression means the tensor R. Uh, let me go down. Let me, let me get some space here. This te expression means the tensor R, which has four slots. And I'm just going to give the slots names. I'm going to call this slot alpha, that slot beta, this slot gamma, and that slot delta. This expression just means the abstract tensor, the linear function of vectors, and it has four slots, and I happen to have given those slots names. And it's just an alternative notation for that. And similarly, this expression involving the contraction on the first and third slots is just an alternative notation for this contraction on slots one and three uh, of the t this tensor. So any geometric frame independent relationship that I want to write down, such as say just the inner product of a vector A with a vector C, I can also write as A mu C mu. This expression obviously says take a vector viewed as an arrow or as a uh, directional derivative, take the scalar product with another vector viewed as an arrow or directional derivative, get a real number out. That expression, I'm asking you to think of this as meaning the same thing. You take the vector a, it's a vector at points in some direction, or equally well, it's a linear function of vectors with one slot whose name was mu. Take the vector c, and uh, you take the inner product of those vectors. And there's no basis present here at all. These are not components on a basis. These represent the geometric frame independent, basis independent vectors themselves. That pre represents the inner product of the vectors with each other. So it's sort of like looking at an Escher drawing. My favorite Escher drawing has this waterfall that uh, you look at it from one point of view and it seems to be uh, going down and then you suddenly discover that, uh, that it's going backwards or something. You can, you can flip your mind back and forth and look at it in different, from different points of view and, uh, and uh, I ask you to do the same thing here. This expression or that expression or this expression can represent either the geometric frame independent uh, 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 relations between vectors and tensors or represent components uh, of those relationships in a basis. Not, we call this slot naming index notation because it's an index notation where the indices are the names of slots. Okay, any questions? So I want, now I want to turn to differentiation. And uh, I've already done differentiation of scalar fields. I now want to do differentiation of tensor fields. And as a tool in doing this, I want to go back on the surface of the Earth again, as I was doing before, and look at a little local Cartesian coordinate system on the surface of the Earth. So. For simplicity, let me go down to the equator of the Earth. There's the equator and lines of constant latitude, lines of constant longitude. And uh, I can go in here and I can build for myself uh, a, co a coordinate system here that is as Cartesian as, as is allowed by the curvature of the surface of the Earth. So this is nice and Cartesian right here at the center. As you move away from the center, it, uh, this coordinate system, uh, you discover it's not quite Cartesian. The smaller a region that you go into, the more nearly Cartesian it obviously is. And the key thing that I want to get out just from drawing pictures is that deviations from the coordinates being Cartesian occur at second order in the distance from the origin of the coordinates. So here's the origin of the coordinates. And uh, what that means, uh, for example, mathematically,
is that G, J, K is the Kronecker delta for the components of the metric plus corrections that are of order, in fact, the distance away from the origin divided by the radius uh, squared of the Earth to get something dimensionless. And so uh, up to corrections of second order, the, f the, f the actual coefficient down here doesn't matter. The main thing that I want is up to things of second order, the metric uh, is really Cartesian. Uh, but when you move away from the origin, you discover that it's curvilinear. That it was forced to be curvilinear by the uh, curvature of the Earth. That occurs only at second order. A simple, another simple way to see it also is that the tangent space. If I lay lay down the tangent space here, uh, or instead, let me lay down the tangent space on the uh, up here in profile. The tangent space agrees with the surface of the Earth, they coincide up to errors of second order in distance you are away from the North Pole in this case. The deviations are at second order, but at first order they agree. What that means then is that when you go in and you look at things like derivatives of vector and tensor fields, but if you only do one derivative, you don't see any influence of uh, the curvature of the Earth. Or in the case of space-time, if you only do one derivative, you don't see any influence. It's only when you do two derivatives that you can begin to see influences. Okay. And I want to t define derivatives, but just one derivative. Okay. And so let's suppose that I have then a uh, tensor field has two slots, for example, uh, but it actually is a function of location in my manifold in space-time or on the surface of the Earth. And I want to differentiate it, and I want to differentiate it along a curve. So here's a curve. My curve uh, is P of zeta. It has a tangent vector A, which is uh, dP d zeta, or d by d zeta, if I adopt the mathematician's point of view. And I want to introduce the concept of the derivative along A of T. So that's analogous to my derivative along A of some scalar field. But now I'm di differentiating, a, differentiating a tensor field. And I want to define that in the usual way of taking a limit as delta zeta goes to 0 uh, of uh, T evaluated at uh, P of zeta plus delta zeta minus P minus uh, so this is P of zeta minus T evaluated at P of zeta divided by delta zeta. Now, I have the problem in take, taking a difference between these two tensors. So these two tensors live in different tangent spaces. This is a linear function of vectors that lives at p of zeta plus delta zeta. This is a linear function of vectors that lives at p of zeta. And those are two different tangent spaces. Tangent spaces are nearly the same because delta zeta is very small, but nevertheless, they are different tangent spaces. And so we have to have some way to carry this tensor, which might be a vector, and then you would just think of it as an arrow, to carry it from the tangent space where it lives to the tangent space uh, at the point where the different derivative is being taken uh, in order to subtract the two from each other. They've got to live in the same tangent space in order for the, me to be able to do linear algebra on them. So I have to parallel transport this guy back. So let me just put a superscript parallel sign. I've parallel transported him back. And then you ask, what does parallel transport mean? And that's where I go back here and I say, look, we're doing one derivative. The fact that, uh, that, the, uh, that the, I'm in a curved manifold just doesn't show up when I'm just doing one derivative. It doesn't show up at first order. So parallel transport must be the same, mean the same thing as what it would have meant if I were in a flat manifold. And what that means then is that if I 
introduce a local Lorentz frame in space-time or local Cartesian coordinates in, uh, in, uh, on the surface of the Earth. What it means is that uh, I hold constant the components in these local Cartesian or local Lorentz coordinates. That's what parallel transport would mean in flat space. It would mean that the components of the tensor or the components of the vector are held fixed in a Lorentz frame or in a, uh, or in a Cartesian coordinate system. And so, uh, but it also, I mean, we all know intuitively what parallel transport means as well for vectors, and then that carries over to tensors from the linear algebra that we're de doing with. So it's parallel transport in the intuitive sense, being something that is insensitive uh, in the small when you're just doing one parallel transport like this not, and not doing two derivatives with one derivative. Uh, it is something that is insensitive to the curvature. So this gives me a definition of the derivative of t along a vector. Any questions? Okay. Having a derivative along a vector, I can then introduce the concept, the concept of a gradient. The deriv if the derivative along a vector a of a tensor field is something that has two slots. The t original tensor field had two slots, and this guy is just a difference between the tensor fields at adjacent points divided by uh, the separation of the points. So it, so it also has two slots. But it is obviously linear in the vector I have chosen with res respect to do the differentiation. Well, I assert that it's linear in it. Uh, I think you can convince yourself that it's linear in it by how the, the derivative was defined. And so that means that there exists some tensor that I'll call the gradient of T, which has three slots. And you are asked to put the third A into the third slot. And then you have a guy that has just two slots left over. Uh, and that's what the derivative along A of T is. So this is a definition of the gradient of t. The gradient of t is a linear function of vectors that has one more slot than t has in it. It has the property that when you put a into the third slot, the last slot is always the differentiation slot. If you put a into the differentiation slot, you get out the derivative along a of t. So now we have a concept of gradient. Um, let me now talk about components of the gradient. So the gradient of T is a third rank tensor. It has components T, alpha, beta, and I'm going to introduce a notation now, mu, E alpha, tensor product E beta, tensor product E mu. It's conventional to stick the differentiation index down, but you could perfectly well put it up if you wish. You can raise, raise and lower it like any other index. But the, uh, anything that comes after the semicolon corresponds to a gradient. It's a gradient index. So this is simply a definition of the, that symbol, and that is a symbol we use for the components of the gradient. And so then you might ask, well, uh, how do I compute the components of the gradient? And the tool for doing that is something called connection coefficients. And they are defined as follows, that uh, gamma mu, I'm sorry, you have a basis. These are components in some basis. You have a basis. Uh, and so you can ask about the derivative along E mu of E alpha. And that's going to be a vector. E alpha is a vector field. It's a basis, but it's a vector. It's, for example, E zero that varies with location in the manifold. Uh, and you're going to differentiate against along, for example, E one. And uh, that is defined to be gamma uh, rho mu alpha 
uh, e rho. Because it's a vector, it can be expanded in the basis itself. And one thing you have to remember is the differentiation index always goes last. So the mu, which is the guy that's doing the differentiation, it goes last here. It went last on the, uh, uh, on the gradient. So that's one rule you have to remember. It's part of the index gymnastics. The formalism has been built so you remember a few things. You remember to line up the indices, and you remember differentiation indices go last. OK, theorem. Well, all these theorems are things for you to prove. Okay. And most of them are one-line proofs. Theorem, uh, the derivative along e mu of e up rho, this was the derivative of e down uh, basis vector. This is minus the same gamma, and now line up indices. You use a differentiation index, it goes at the end. Rho is up, so it goes in the only location for an upslot on this gamma. And then there has to be, we're expanding in a basis, uh, E sigma. And we've got to line up our indices. But there's a, a sign flip, and you will derive that sign flip. And then line up the indices. And then you will also prove another theorem. This is maybe a three-line calculation. Knowing that these connection coefficients tell you how the basis vectors change from location to location, then when you want to know about the components of the gradient, those components are going to have to have corrections for the fact that the components may change artificially because the basis vectors are changing when you go from one point to another. You have to correct, and so that could make, T might be truly constant, but if the basis vectors are changing from point to point, the components will change. And you've got to correct for the fact that the components change due to the basis vectors changing. Okay. So this gradient of T turns out to be first do an ordinary derivative. Now, what does this ordinary derivative mean, this comma? It means differentiate along E gamma T alpha beta as though it were a scalar field. This is just some T03 is some function of location in space time. Treat it as though it were a scalar field. Differentiate along E gamma to get T alpha beta comma gamma. In a, ba in a coordinate basis, This will just be partial with respect to x gamma of t alpha beta. But if you're not in a coordinate basis, that's not what it will be. I'm sorry, gamma, gamma. Then you have to have corrections. I'm going to put one of these indices down in order to explain the corrections more clearly. Okay. You need a correction for each slot to correct for the fact that the basis vector that went into that slot might be changing from point to point, producing artificial changes in the components. And the corrections are, correct this slot, so you throw on a gamma with this uh, index that, was, uh, that is the name of that slot coming over onto the gamma, differentiation index on the end of the gamma, and now you have a dummy index, uh, mu, and t mu beta. You're, you have replaced the index that is being corrected by a dummy index and summed, strangled. And the index being, that's being corrected has come over onto the gamma. And nothing was being done with this index, so it just goes along, I'm sorry, uh, with this index beta, so it just stays where it was. Then you've got to correct for the changing of the beta index, and that gives you a minus sign, a gamma, the differentiation index goes last. The beta index goes the only other place it can if it's down. And there must be a summation index, mu, then a t alpha mu. This was the guy that was getting corrected, and so it's uh, moved over on. It's strangled up against a gamma. The beta went along for a free, uh, for a free I'm sorry. Um, The beta guy is the one that's being corrected, okay? 
the beta is being corrected. Uh, and it was the last index, so it's turned into a mu. The mu gets strangled, and the differentiation index is, is the gamma. OK, I'm going to stop there. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, curvature on Monday and then start doing some applications, do some physics. Okay. So, and I think there's probably a class trying to get in here, but I'm not sure. I suspect so. So let's get out quickly. If anybody has questions, let's answer them in the hallway. Maybe there's not a class in here today.